Hi, and good afternoon. This is Elizabeth Hardig with the American Planning Association. And welcome to our Plan for Health Rural Communities Toolkit webinar. It is just about 3 o'clock, and I see a few more folks are entering the webinar room. So I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We will be recording the webinar, and the recording will be available on the Plan for Health Project website. You're welcome to chat questions throughout the webinar, though we have saved some time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. If you are not familiar with the Plan for Health Project, uh, Plan for Health is, a, is an initiative supported by the Planning and Community Health Center at APA in partnership with the American Public Health Association. The Eastern Highlands Coalition, you'll be hearing more about today, is one of our 35 coalitions across the country. If you're interested in hearing more about any of the particular projects or checking out some of our resources, please go to planforhealth.us, and there's a link right there in the chat box. And also in the chat box is a link to the online toolkit that Liza will be sharing more about uh, today. So let me go ahead and introduce Liza McCoo, who will be our presenter from the Eastern Highlands Health District. So Liza is a part-time project specialist for the Plan for Health grant. Liza has a bachelor's degree from the University of Connecticut, a master's degree in education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and is a PhD candidate in the NEAG School of Education at the University of Connecticut. Liza's dissertation research focuses on the influence of health-related stigma on the success of young people in the educational environment. She has nearly 15 years of experience working in community wellness. Liza previously worked at Eastern Connecticut State University as the Wellness Promotion Coordinator, as well as the Program Manager for School, Campus, and Community Health Programs with the Governor's Prevention Partnership in Connecticut. In her spare time, Liza instructs fitness classes at the local community center, is an avid reader, and supports the interests of her three young children. And we're so excited to have you here today, Liza, and I will turn things over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm hoping everybody's hearing me. Um, yes. So you can tell me I'm active, Elizabeth? Yes, you sound great. OK, great, awesome. So welcome. This is a new forum for me. I've never done a webinar in this capacity before. So. Um, Forgive me if I stumble over myself a little bit as I get used to this uh, format. <clears throat> so um, I want to give you a really brief overview of our project and our region, and then we'll go more in depth and get into some specifics about the, um, the toolkit that we developed with the Plan for Health funding. Um, so here in the presentation here, uh, as uh, Elizabeth was saying, this is a Plan for Health project. Um, I'm with the Eastern Highland Health District. We are um, the project leaders for this project through the grant given to the Connecticut chapter of the American Planning Association. Um, but we facilitated most of the um, work for this project um, in partnership with our Community Health Action Response Team, which is uh, abbreviated to CHART. So with that, I'm going to kind of dive right in and hope that this, here we go. So Eastern Highland Health District is a regional public health department. Um, we, pro we provide services to 10 towns in Eastern Connecticut. And we have a little bit of a variation in population, but we're really small. So our smallest town is Scotland, Connecticut, and we have about not even 1,700 uh, residents in that town. And then our largest town is Mansfield, which has um, a census population of 26,000 people. But about half of that are the um, students that live on campus only during the academic year. So you can cut that number in half um, for Mansfield. And the next biggest town would be Tolland, which does have about 20 to 24,000 um, residents. So we are 10 very small towns. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Community Health Action Response Team, called CHART, is the community coalition or the regional coalition that um, supported this work and this project, and really spearheaded the initiative. Um, it is a cross-sector of uh, various representatives within the community, from um, town planners and first selectmen, school personnel, um, and small nonprofit organizations as well. So it really runs the gamut. So our Plan for Health project had a few goals, um, and it really led to the development. These goals kind of walked us 
uh, through the process to the development of the toolkit. Our first step in the process was to complete a key informant interview and focus groups around the infrastructure and resources that supported the um, physical activity within our communities. So uh, specifically biking and walking and playing within our 10 towns. We used the results of the key informant interviews to develop the plan for this online toolkit. Um, we also wanted to increase collaboration between the public health and town planning and zoning officials, as well as the enthusiasm for increasing physical ac access to healthy foods and physical activity within our region. Um, and we wanted uh, towns to help. We wanted to help towns identify practical and feasible short and long-term tools um, that they could work with EHH do to implement. So for those who are not familiar with Eastern Connecticut, we, are, um, we really are rich in natural beauty. There are a lot of state and town parks and forests, a lot of public trails, a lot of biking trails. Um, and there, there are a lot of uh, opportunities for physical activity. However, um, there are a lot of obstacles as well. So what we found during our needs assessment and our uh, key informant interview process was that nine out of, uh, residents in nine out of 10 towns really felt that there were not safe options for um, walking and biking or for families to play within the towns. Um, that, and you can see this picture in the PowerPoint. Um, that kind of is, it denotes most of the major roads within our town. We have these rural highway routes, um, and we also have little cul-de-sac communities, but there are very few walkable um, accessible main streets that are connected to all of the other um, pockets within the community. So that was really what we wanted to look at. And um, we, uh, along with the chart, we had identified that planning and zoning commissioners really are our key partners in this process. Um, and that they make really important decisions that impact our community health, such as housing and commercial development interconnectedness, traffic flow, safety of roads, um, sidewalks, complete streets, that sort of thing. But there really is a lack of knowledge, skills, and resources for incorporating these public health concepts into the planning decisions in these small um, planning and zoning commissions. So we decided to develop, through the course of this needs assessment, this toolkit. And it took a few. Um, forms over the course of the project. We went back and forth based on our feedback, whether we wanted to do a solely an online toolkit or a printed toolkit, a combination of both. How, what was the best method to get this information across to our small towns? Um, and this was, it, it was a several month process to really pin down exactly how this toolkit was going to come into shape. Um, and ultimately, we did decide um, to create an online toolkit with some printable materials in addition. We tried initially to do it in-house, but ended up um, hiring consultants, the Fitzgerald and Halliday Incorporated, to develop our toolkit so that it was really sharp and user-friendly, um, had all the search functions and uh, capacity that we needed. And you know, we are prevention professionals and wellness promotion professionals and not graphic designers. So we really felt in order to make it um, a useful and interesting and appealing toolkit for the communities that we needed some people who had expertise in this area to, to actually develop and put it together. Um, so the Fitzgerald and Halliday worked really closely with the chart for edits and reviews and information. And we did about three focus groups with our community health action response team to put together the, um, the toolkit. And we're going to go into the toolkit a little bit more in a second. But I do have a screenshot for you. So this is kind of the uh, final uh, home page for the toolkit. So that's what it's going to look. That's what it looks like. And we're going to get into that again in a minute. And then, like I said, there were some folks who really wanted a printable document. Um, a lot. I went to every single planning and zoning committee meeting, um, or every single town rather, for a meeting, and we're really talking about you know, meeting in a small room. No real, most of them did not have good technology to work with. So they needed, needed something that they could actually hold in their hand because they did not have presentation material, uh, 
technology in the meetings. So we did create this uh, printable quick guide, um, which I highlighted there in a screenshot for you. We also held um, toolkit workshops to orient um, all of the planning and zoning commissioners and anybody who was interested really within the region and beyond um, to orient them to this toolkit, how to use it, um, and how it's structured. And we're going to get into that because everything is extremely intentional in this toolkit. Um, so upon, upon publication of the toolkit, we did hold these workshops. And we had about 50 people attend. Um, and most of our communities were represented, and several communities within the region that are not part of our uh, district. So the last thing I wanted to mention before we get into the toolkit itself is the quick audit. Now, the quick audit was not something that we had planned to develop in the beginning of this process. But it came about when we were planning for the workshops and trying to figure out how to make the toolkit the most useful, valuable tool that we could. And what we realized was there was a lot of really great information on the toolkit, but it could be sort of overwhelming. And you can look and um, I, we envisioned community members going to the toolkit, opening it up, and not really knowing where to begin and what links to even click to, to find more information that would be helpful for them. So we developed this quick audit, which really did make the use of the toolkit a simple one, two, three process. So the goal is that um, folks would go on, complete this quick audit, grade themselves, and there's instructions on how to do that, and we're going to look at that in a minute. Um, and then based on the grades that they got through this quick audit, they would go to the toolkit to the corresponding section um, from the quick audit, and there they would be able to find the um, resources that they would need to address the issues that were apparent in the quick audit as being um, community needs. So that was the final piece that, that really made the toolkit um, a really useful, helpful tool for folks. So that's the PowerPoint. And now I just want to, um, I'm going to drag over the, the website. And I'm going to walk you through the website. And then there will be some opportunities for questions. So this is the live website. Um, we, uh, in working with FHI, Fitzgerald and Halliday, we were very intentional about the structure of this website and what went on here and how it was all laid out and everything. So um, the first thing you'll notice is that it's pretty clean. There's not a lot of text. We can scroll down, and there's like this, this section here is where you're going to see the most amount of text. Um, just a little introduction. And we're not going to spend too much time on all of the little details. You can read the paragraphs on your own later. Um, but this front page is really an introduction to this toolkit and some information um, to get folks excited about using the toolkit. All the photos are um, local. We really wanted to make this uh, identifiable for our communities. However, it's not exclusionary. We we want everybody within the, re in, within the nation who identifies with small rural communities to be able to use this toolkit. So here uh, you can see this little um, icon here, a little image that we made, so that folks coming in and using this toolkit knew that we understood that there's many uh, components to community health and community wellness that we understand that the information that they're going to find within this toolkit is not the end all and be all of community health. And there are so many other elements. But you can see here in the physical uh, components of community wellness, this is where this toolkit is looking. So we're not going to give you in, uh, information on educational health or environmental, environmental health. We're really talking about access to physical activity and access to nutrition and healthy foods uh, within this toolkit. There is a local land use quick guide that we created for the toolkit. Um, one of the things we heard from members of the focus groups and key informant interviews was that um, sometimes folks come on to a planning and zoning commission, and they're not given um, an in-depth orientation to what it means to be a planning and zoning commissioner. And they sort of have to learn it as they go. So we decided we couldn't spend a lot of time um, teaching people what it meant to be a planning and zoning commissioner. But we gave them a quick guide, um, and I'll click on that for you. So a really quick overview where we see community health falls within the job description of a planning and zoning commissioner. 
and then some links. These are local links here um, for folks to uh, understand more about the job and their responsibilities. So um, then going back to the bottom here, you'll notice that there's a uh, website quick guide. This is the printed material I was talking about. You can click this, and up will come a printable document. We also printed about 2,000 copies of this in-house. So um, if anybody wants some really nice cardstock copies of this, you can uh, send an email to me or anybody else at the EHHC staff, and we can get some sent over to you. Um, but this is the printable document that folks can print and take with them to uh, meetings or use uh, to send out to other folks within the community, get them interested and excited about the toolkit. So I'm going to take a quick walk through um, the physical activity section here. The access to healthy foods and physical activity is structured the same way on both uh, sections. So in each section, there's an intro. It's an argument of why this is important. And then each section has a series of links to help you um, address that title. So here it says tools to assess needs. We give you a few links to, um, to assess needs within your community. And then you'll notice we um, have uh, titles for each of our sections. Here's the walkability section. So folks who identified that walkability was an issue for their community, they come here and they look at the section here and there's an intro and then links. So how we um, structured this toolkit was um, all of the links are, are um, organized in terms of distance. So the first links that you'll see on these lists are hyperlocal. So those are the first links are going to be prioritized in terms of towns that are within our region. And then you're going to have towns, small rural communities that are within Connecticut. Then you're going to have uh, examples and links of small rural communities in our region, of the New England region. And then you're going to get more national links and even some federal uh, links down here. So that's kind of how we're structured. And again, that's the same for all of the uh, sections within this toolkit. I'm going to scroll on down to the bottom again, and I'm going to open up the uh, Community Health Quick Audit for you. So this is uh, what I was talking about earlier. This Quick Audit it really is the first stop for folks coming on to our website and using um, the toolkit. It has a really brief introduction, and then what you'll notice is each section of the website has its own um, survey in the, in the quick audit. So here's the walkability section, and there are a few questions that we put under here to assess your walkability. Now the idea is individuals can complete this, but the idea really is that you, uh, your community planning and zoning commission or a community coalition or some group of folks who know the community well will complete this together and agree on some average scores um, and answer these questions as a group. Um, with that, complete all of these sections, and it's broken up into physical activity and access to healthy foods. Um, with that, you go here to the scoring section, and you can give yourself a score. Um, and what you can do at the end of this process is you say, oh, look, we did not do so well in our physical activity, and our wayfinding section was really low. We were pretty good on bikeability and pretty good on walkability, and connectivity was also really low. So communities can go directly back into the website and say, all right, let's go into the walkability section, or I'm sorry, the connectivity section, because we identified connectivity as a really low scoring area in our quick audit. They go here, they can click on the links and get ideas on ways to improve their community health in terms of connectivity. So that really is how the toolkit works. Um, I'll just open up the, physical, the uh, healthy food section. So you can see, again, local pictures uh, structured the same way. And the last section is the funding and partnerships page. 
because obviously that's going to be really important. A lot of the activities and strategies that we implement or that we uploaded onto this toolkit are, um, are going to be really cost effective or have no cost other than some, some man hours or be really a policy decision rather than a funding issue. Um, however, there are, there are things on here that will require communities to have money. So um, this is a little bit of a clearinghouse of uh, different opportunities for funding. We also included here a guide. This was something that we put together in-house, tips for applying to grants, and then some uh, links to websites and ideas for books that might help communities write grant applications. So. so that is really the toolkit and the end of the piece that I'm presenting. So I think we're going to move on to questions now. Yes, that, think... that would be great. And thank you, Liza. This was okay. really um, helpful. So folks are welcome to submit questions uh, via the chat box or you could unmute your individual line by hitting pound six and ask a question directly over the phone. Um, this toolkit came together um, really, really well. I, I remember way back when, over uh, last summer, when um, folks were going through the interviewing process and you were connecting with local planning and zoning commissions and, and really trying to figure out what would be helpful for these 10 towns and, and how could you identify themes that were coming up across all of the, the smaller communities to, to build out a toolkit um, and to strengthen the local capacity for planning and public health. And I think that um, this just came together really, really well. Thank you. Yeah, and we worked hard to make it a very usable tool. And um, we took out almost all of the jargon. Um, oh, and I will also show way down at the bottom here, um, we do have, I have to find this again. So we have this search function here, um, which, so let's say you have a question about, oh, and I can't spell, but playability. It'll bring up uh, links here to take you directly to that section mm -hmm. where you can find playability. There's also built in, and it should be, I'm not finding it at this exact second. But there also is a glossary of terms built into the website here so that if folks have a question, oh, here it is, have a question about some of the terms that we're using, they can open up this glossary of terms and get a quick definition so that the website isn't confusing. So. That's really fabulous. We were just um, chatting with our Cohort 2 Plant Health Coalitions about, about jargon and really trying to make planning and public health accessible um, and not use terms like the built environment. <laughs> right, <laughs> So right. it's wonderful that that's, that's here on the website and, and this tool is really open to community members and other folks who want to learn a little bit more. Yeah. So I wonder Do if we have questions coming in? I don't, I'm not seeing any on the, the chat bar here. Uh, not just yet. It, it, sometimes there's a little bit of a delay as folks are, okay. are typing. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about how um, how the, the Planning and Zoning Commissions have received the, the toolkit so far? I know you mentioned a couple of orientation workshops and yeah. everyone was very involved in the kind of the design side. Yes. So we had, um, we did extensive outreach to the 10 Planning and Zoning Commissions. Um, I went in personally to as many of them as I could to orient them to or just really introduce the concept of the toolkit. Um, so we um, went in, because I, I noticed a question just popped up, and I can answer it right now, actually. So Heather's asking who the audience is for this toolkit, public or planning commissions or both. So really, the, um, it, so it's both, but primarily we're talking to planning commissions. Um, the planning and zoning commissions in our region are the same commission. Like I said, we're really small here. So, uh, most communities have one planning and zoning commission that um, is really responsible for making decisions about the built environment. Um, and this toolkit is designed specifically for them. However, we also knew that there is a need for the public to be able to access it and 
to understand it and to use it as a tool to encourage their planning and zoning commissioners or their first selectmen or whoever to, um, to increase phys uh, access to healthy foods and physical activity. So it's made for both, but really the primary audience is the uh, planning and zoning commissioners. So uh, we have a question here that asks how the toolkit has resulted in changes in the built environment or policy changes to local codes or ordinances. So we don't have any measurable changes in the built environment at this exact moment. Um, the toolkit was launched uh, about a month ago, so uh, we're really just getting it launched right now within the communities. Um, we are optimistic that it's going to lead to built environment, um, changes in the built environment. Um, based on the feedback at the workshops, the uh, planning and zoning commissioners that did attend the workshops uh, were really felt that the toolkit was very enlightening, as well as the quick audit to help them identify needs within their community, um, and specifically how to address those needs in a way that was, um, to use a uh, jargony term, lighter, quicker, cheaper. So things that are quick to implement, that aren't going to cost a million dollars, um, and that are going to be effective and are usable on a small scale, like our small scale communities. So. Um, so we have uh, information to suggest that it's going to start very soon implementing, I'm sorry, uh, impacting local codes and ordinances and the way that planning and zoning commissioners do business and just the fact that they now understand how to keep the concept of public health in their mind when making decisions about sidewalks and housing development and such. Um, so uh, another question coming in, oh, uh, public health metrics that we found to be most convincing to different audiences. Um, you know, it was really individual. So we had certain planning and zoning commissioners. So they're all volunteers. Um, they meet a couple of hours a month. Um, and so what people are interested in really depends on their background. So we have folks. I remember one conversation was with a woman who was a retired nurse. So she was totally on board from the minute I introduced the concept, and she didn't need to know any more about health metrics. Um, but other folks who maybe work in a more business side of things who are not necessarily attached to public health as part of their career um, really needed to hear more about how um, increasing physical activity and access to healthy food makes the community healthy and happier, as well as um, is good for uh, in residents and um, just community happiness and, and satisfaction with their living environment. So um, it really was dependent on who was in the room to understand what the metrics were that were going to be important to them. And that was part of what the initial outreach was to understand each community, where they were coming from, and who was represented on their community, uh, I'm sorry, on their planning and zoning commission. And that's really a theme that we hear from other Plan for Health coalitions as well. There's a certain amount of information that's useful kind of in, a, in broad strokes to disseminate, yeah. you know, over social media or Facebook, but really being able to sit down one-on-one um, -on -one with decision makers and, and talk through their perspective and, and mm -hmm. how they think about these types of projects. Um, and certainly it's always wonderful if you can make the economic case and right. for why these changes are, are important and, and useful. Um, and we also, we, one of the tools we used was a, a video um, that had, it didn't really have like statistics, it didn't tell you the percent of change you can expect in community happiness if you implement these tools, but um, it talked about the, the health pathway, so, or the the health spiral or, or however you want to put it, but um, it talked about how the lack of connectivity in a community, the lack of access to walking, um, lack of access to healthy foods, um, increased heart health issues, uh, diabetes issues, um, mental health issues. So we talked about them in, like you were saying, Elizabeth, in more broad strokes that if you address these issues of community health, um, you can expect happiness to increase, health metrics to increase in a general term. But obviously, we can't give them any specific detail, uh, specific stats. 
on exactly what's going to um, increase and improve because it's so community dependent. Mm -hmm. And just as another um, resource for folks through the Plan for Health project, the National New Hampshire um, site they did start to quantify some particular investments for their community just to kind of help folks understand the potential ROI for, for strategies. Um, so I think once once towns identify a particular project, you could get into more of the details. But um, certainly this toolkit is a great framework to start some of those conversations. And to your point, Eliza, just to really have health at the forefront of, of folks of their minds as they're thinking about um, planning decisions. Right, and that was our primary goal. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we are just at um, 3.30, which is the scheduled um, end of the webinar. And I, I do see another question is coming in. So if you have a moment to stay with us, um, yep. we could address one more question. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us today. We certainly appreciate uh, hearing from you, Liza, and just learning more about what's happening in Eastern Highlands Health District. And the, the question looks like um, from Celia, is it part of the area's comprehensive plan, the toolkit? Um, we hope to make it part of their plan. So um, the, the health district, we're, we have a wellness promotion um, element to our work. We are a support to communities. We're not, a po we're not policy makers. So we have um, limited ability to, you know, or we have no ability to force folks <laughs> to use this toolkit in any way, shape, or form. So um, we are hoping that we have convinced folks to uh, take the elements that they're learning in this toolkit and make it part of their comprehensive plans. Um, and, and so far, we're seeing that communities are really open to um, taking some of the things that they're learning here and just plug them in to their strategic plans. Um, and their planning of conservation and development that most of our regions are working on right now. Great. Great. And, and another quick plan for health resource, um, the Trenton, New Jersey project, which of course is a slightly different area, um, they did work on a health and food system element for the city's master plan. Um, and they will be, will be posting that, uh, the template for the health and food system element on the plan for health website in the next few weeks. Um, but right now there's just some general information and a short video about the project if you're interested in, in learning more about that. Well, wonderful. This has been really fantastic. And thank you so much for your time, Liza, and to thank all of you. you for listening in. And, we and will uh, please feel free to contact us at EHHD if you have any thoughts or questions, or if you want me to mail you out some of those uh, quick guides. Wonderful. And you know what? I will type my email address in the chat box right now, and you're welcome to um, reach out to me, and I can connect you with Liza and Eastern Great. Highland. Thank you so much. Thank you. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be